of Jesus. Jehovah himself said, This is my son, the beloved, whom I have approved. Listen to him. But in order to do so obediently as Jehovah's sheep, we must reject the voice of strangers. But how would you handle things if the voice of strangers was brought to you by someone close, a friend, or perhaps even a family member? That's what Jade faces in the following dramatization. How will she learn to reject the voice of strangers in a sensitive situation? Smells wonderful. Mm. Oh wait, I forgot. You should cook every night. If you clean every night. Uh, no, we'll take it in turns. Ta-da! But this looks amazing. Mm. Thanks. It's a practice for my first guest. Really? Who? My mum. That's wonderful. We had our first phone call in a year that wasn't a total disaster, so. I invited her around tomorrow. It'll go great. So yes, we have the return of Jade and Nita, the stars of the 2020 Always Rejoice convention, are back with us to help impress the importance of avoiding the voice of strangers, making sure that the only voice we listen to is that of Jehovah's organization or the governing body. That's the purpose here. If I had to guess, this is not the last time we'll be seeing Jade and Nita. I think when we see that intro showing various clips from the Jade and Nita dramatizations followed by the title screen, that indicates to me that they intend to keep revisiting the Jade and Nita storyline because I think they realize that this is a popular duo. They've managed to find this combination that works well when it comes to the audience finding them believable because let's face it, they're good actors. I think that the whoever it is playing... Nita and Jade, I think they're genuinely good actors, which is actually quite rare <laughs> when it comes to Jehovah's Witness dramatizations. Anyway, if you haven't done so already, I would urge you to check out my video on the Jade and Nita saga as presented at the Always Rejoice convention. If T-Boy is gracious, a thumbnail will appear to the story of Jade and Nita, how to turn someone into a Jehovah's Witness in 14 steps, because that's essentially the purpose of these characters, or at least it was when we first saw them. Jade was a student who was recruited by Nita after Jade saw Nita doing cart witnessing, and there was a series of dramatizations just brazenly showing the methods of manipulation that Jehovah's Witnesses use to recruit people into the group. And usually, thankfully, these methods, these strategies, I think, don't work on thinking adults with developed critical thinking skills. I think that it's quite unusual, unless there is some underlying trauma, some kind of emotional issue that Jehovah's Witnesses can pounce upon and exploit. I think for most people, the beliefs, the ideas, 
are just so ludicrous that no amount of manipulation is going to get someone to fall for them. But in the case of Jade and Nita, because it's all fictional, because they can just make things work when it's a dramatization, Jade falls for everything. And now we've fast forwarded in the story to where Jade and Nita are now living together, which I think most of us could see coming at some point. <laughs> They do at least have a chaperone who appears to be living with them, so presumably she's keeping them on the straight and narrow. Anyway, Jade talks about her mother, and she mentions that she had, or they had, our first phone call in a year that wasn't a total disaster. So I invited her round tomorrow. We saw a glimpse of what phone calls between Jade and her mother looked like during the convention dramatizations. Here's a clip. You listen. Isn't this just another of your phases? It's time to move on, love. The holidays are our time. It's all I get from you. Promise me you'll be here. <laughs> So that gives us some idea of what Jade meant when she said total disaster. Phone conversations with her mother were a total disaster for a year. Well, that's why. Because the religion she has recently joined drives a wedge between believers and unbelieving family members. It's going to cause friction one way or the other. In this case, the mother simply wanted to see her daughter for Christmas because her daughter was a student. Presumably she's no longer a student because, of course, higher education isn't allowed for Jehovah's Witnesses. Now she's a Jehovah's Witness and she's given up Christmas and she's given up weed. That was another part of the dramatizations. Uh, she'll almost certainly have given up higher education. Goodness knows how an engaged, caring, compassionate, concerned mother would react to such huge changes in their daughter. And so when Jade is referring to friction in the phone conversations, quite frankly, that is justified. Now, what we're going to see as this new dramatization progresses, we're going to see Jade's mother, who is bent on trying to retrieve the critical thinking skills of her daughter. Hi, Mum. Hello, love. Come in. Nice to see you. Nice to see you too. Yeah, let me take that. Oh, thanks, my love. It's fine. Your roommates, you say they're explorers? Pioneers. They preach full-time, but they work part-time. Hmm, I see. But you, you're no, not... No. Not yet, anyway. Jade, love. All this. I see it's made you a better person. Heaven knows I tried. But I miss bits of the old Jade. Bits? <laughs> what, what bits? Where's the jade that questioned everything? So then she pulls out her phone and starts showing me stuff about witnesses. What kind of stuff? News stories, all negative and slanted. I tried to change the subject, but she just kept at it. See you later, girls. Oh, bye. Bye, Keisha. 
Sorry, I am. Um, I've got to get ready. Jade's mother wants to show her some more links. <laughs> this is going to get interesting, isn't it? So yes, Jade's mother is understandably, I think we can agree, concerned about what's happening to her daughter. I say what's happening, it's more a case of what's happened. Jade has been fully converted to the Jehovah's Witness faith to the point where She's seemingly unable to question anything. There were two points in this particular segment that I found most interesting. The first being... Jade, love. All this. I see it's made you a better person. Heaven knows I tried. But I miss bits of the old Jade. Bits? <laughs> what, what bits? Where's the jade that questioned everything? So right off the bat, the audience is being told that being a Jehovah's Witness makes you a better person than being a non-Jehovah's Witness. Once you get indoctrinated, once you take on the new personality, your unbelieving family and friends will notice that you've suddenly magically become this new, improved version of yourself. Heaven knows I tried, says Jade's mother. So her efforts apparently have come up short when it comes to raising her daughter. What was needed was for Jade to join a cult in order for Jade to be a good person. That is unambiguously the message. And by the way, I don't want to harp on about this too much. But it's a little bit disconcerting for me to watch this particular installment of the Jade and Nita saga because I personally know the actress who is performing the role of Jade's mother. We were friends when I was one of Jehovah's Witnesses. We, I wouldn't say we were close friends, but she worked in the town where I grew up. We shared the same circle of friends. We'd go on days out, on trips to Alton Towers, on walks, all of that sort of thing. All very wholesome. Um, but yeah, we knew each other. And I'm not going to say her surname, but her name is Susie. And in addition to being friends with her, I was also friends with her husband, the gentleman she ended up marrying, and I went to their wedding. So as you can imagine, it's a little bit jarring for me to be watching this when you actually know someone who's in the drama, who's being used in the propaganda. Anyway, that's out of the way. The other thing I wanted to draw to your attention is the following exchange between Jade and Nita. So then she pulls out her phone and starts showing me stuff about witnesses. What kind of stuff? News stories, all negative and slanted. I tried to change the subject, but she just kept at it. This is very interesting. Actually, the whole dramatization is interesting. It's giving us breadcrumbs, or hopefully Jehovah's Witnesses, breadcrumbs to follow that give a major clue as to just how manipulative this group is. When it comes to information about Jehovah's Witnesses that Jehovah's Witnesses are looking at or reading or watching, it has to be positive. It just has to be positive. It cannot be negative. The problem with the information that Jade's mother was showing Jade was that it was, quote, all negative and slanted. Slanted meaning that the overall impression given of Jehovah's Witnesses was not a favourable one. 
you then have to ask the question, if you're watching this kind of objectively, well, isn't Jehovah's Witness material about Jehovah's Witnesses slanted? Where are you going to get a Watchtower article or a JW Broadcasting episode where they say, you know what, here are a few times where we goofed up. You know, here's a few times in Jehovah's Witness history where we made some serious mistakes that we regret. Or here are things that we're doing now that we'd like to improve on. And we'd really appreciate your input. Where are you going to get that kind of language in Jehovah's Witness materials, in Jehovah's Witness propaganda? You're not going to get it because it is slanted. It's okay, apparently, for Jehovah's Witness materials to be slanted, but it's not okay for external third-party materials about Jehovah's Witnesses to be in any way slanted or negative. Well, how long are you going to be gone for? I'll stay another month. I told my daughter it's too hot here. <laughs> What's happened to me? <laughs> Abigail? Jade girl, how are you? Been better. Oh, Nita said that your mother visited. I hope you don't mind. No. Mum's driving me mad. It's, it's like it's her hobby to ruin my life. Oh. She sounds wonderful. Like me when my daughter got baptised. You opposed your daughter? Oh, mercy, yes. I love her so much and didn't want to lose her. But I'm not going anywhere. Of course not, but a worried mother doesn't know that. Mother, lunch is ready. I got to go, but I have a scripture for you. When you read it, remember, your mum is not the stranger. John chapter 10 and verse 5. They will by no means follow a stranger, but will flee from him, because they do not know the voice of strangers. Mum, it's not the stranger. It's what she shares. Reject the voice, not her. Did you look at those links that I sent you? Mum, I want us to get together, but I won't hear anything negative about my beliefs. Well, perhaps we just won't talk religion. It's a deal then? All right then. I can see I'm not going to get anywhere. So what subject do you want to talk about? The deal fell apart fast. Jade, I know we weren't going to talk religion, but I must tell you this one thing that Mom, I read. I thought we weren't going to talk about this. It's getting late. I'm gonna go. <sighs> Thanks for dinner. I'll call you tomorrow. If you're watching this as someone who's never been one of Jehovah's Witnesses, there should be multiple red flags. <laughs> already in this dramatization. We've already learned that it would be a terrible thing for a Jehovah's Witness to look at something that's negative, something that isn't slanted in favor of the organization. It's okay to read stuff that's slanted in favor of the organization, just not the opposite. The part I really want to zone in on is this. They will by no means follow a stranger, but will flee from him, because 
they do not know the voice of strangers. Mum is not the stranger. It's what she shares. Reject the voice. Not her. Did you look at those links that I sent you? Mum. I want us to get together, but I won't hear anything negative about my beliefs. Let's start with that last point. Mum, I want us to get together. Do you mean, Jade, Mum, I want us to be able to have a relationship? <laughs> Notice how they use language in such a clever way. It's clearly not just about whether they're getting together or not. It's clearly not just about the occasional meal. It's about whether Jade's mother is allowed to be in her daughter's life. It's about whether they're allowed to have a relationship or not. But the propaganda twists things. Apparently it's apostates who twist things. It's not the organisation who would pull this sort of trick, and yet you're seeing it right there in front of you. A relationship between a mother and daughter is merely getting together. Mum, I want us to get together, but I won't hear anything negative about my beliefs. So those are the terms that you're expected to accept if you are the mother or father of someone who's just been indoctrinated into the Jehovah's Witness religion. You're supposed to just not talk about the religion if it's anything critical. You're allowed to say positive things. You're allowed to have positive views or ideas about the religion. But you are not, under any circumstances, allowed to show anything negative. How is this not a massive red flag for anyone who's just objectively looking at this religion, who hasn't yet bought into the indoctrination? All of this will make total sense if you're watching this propaganda as a Jehovah's Witness who's already invested years or decades in this. But how is this going to play to a non-Jehovah's Witness impartial, objective observer. They are shooting themselves in the foot by being so overtly culty in their material. And this whole thing about the voice of strangers, which is what all of this is about, and indeed this was the verse that Stephen Lett was referring to in his opening remarks. Who gets to be a stranger and who gets to be a non-stranger would be my question. So apparently, whoever manages to get your attention first is the one you should trust, effectively. I really want you to think about this if you're one of Jehovah's Witnesses in particular. Who gets to be the stranger and who gets to be the familiar voice? Is it just a case of if you get there first, then you're not the stranger? Is it just a case of, oh, if you don't actually physically know somebody or you, you're unfamiliar with them or you don't know exactly what their intentions are, you should automatically dismiss what they're saying. Shouldn't the final arbiter be truth? Shouldn't it be the case that irrespective of whether someone is a stranger or not, irrespective of how familiar you are with a person, what really matters is whether what they're saying is true. Because you could be in an abusive relationship with someone that you've known for years or decades. This person is clearly not a stranger. This person is the opposite of a stranger. 
but they can still be manipulating you and using you and gaslighting you and making you do things that you wouldn't otherwise wish to do because it suits them. They're not a stranger, but they're very, very dangerous. While on the other hand, you could have someone who you've never met before who wants to help you and who is giving you information that is factually correct and who is giving you arguments that are logical and reasonable and sound. All of this stuff about the voice of a stranger is itself manipulation because the ultimate message underneath all of this is the governing body saying, you know us, you've known us for years, you know the organization, you know your fellow worshippers. Why would we lie to you when we've all known each other for so long? It shouldn't matter how long you've known someone for or how long you've been in an organization for. It's equally likely for someone to lie to you who you know well, who you trust, as it is for someone to lie to you who you don't know well. Jade, I got an alert this morning and I'm really Mom, worried about this. No, I don't... I, I was sure this wouldn't work. And then it happened. Jade, I'd like to change our agreement. If I ask you what you believe, you get to answer. Short answers, I won't be converting. <laughs> It's a deal, then? Yeah, it's a deal. <laughs> How wise it was for Jade to distinguish between the dangerous falsehoods about Jehovah's people and the person unwittingly promoting them. Jade took a clear stand but she also patiently showed that she loved her mother. This not only protected Jade from dangerous thinking, but also helped her mother. So there we have it. That's the Jade and Nita comeback. Apparently, if you are the parent of someone who's just been indoctrinated as a Jehovah's Witness, first of all, you need to remember not to say anything negative not to show anything critical or share anything critical, I should say, with your believing son or daughter. And second of all, we've learned that it's possible to wear you down <laughs> by insisting on not talking about anything negative. Eventually, this will have the effect of making you want to have only positive conversations about the religion so that only your indoctrinated son or daughter gets to share information. You don't get to share negative information, but they get to share positive information. That's apparently how this works. It's, again, hopelessly unrealistic. We're not talking about something that Jehovah's Witnesses or newly converted Jehovah's Witnesses can reasonably expect. We're talking about the fantasy that the governing body imagines in these scenarios. And they can imagine whatever they want. <laughs> they can have any number of ideas about how this sort of situation will play out. But I would humbly suggest that this is not remotely how things would work out in reality, of course, there will always be exceptions, but by and large, I think what would happen in this situation is that a, a son or daughter will have a wedge driven between themselves and their parents. Because which parent is going to be fine 
with their son or daughter joining a cult and is going to just roll over and refuse to discuss anything critical about the group that's completely taken over the thinking and personality of their darling child. Which parent's going to be fine with that? And which parent's going to say, actually, yeah, we won't talk about anything critical. We'll just talk about positive stuff and you get to preach to me so long as you keep it short. It's just not going to happen. But what I found most interesting was not necessarily what we saw depicted in the concluding moments of the dramatization, but just the overtly culty rhetoric of Stephen Lett, who has apparently shared all his inhibitions when it comes to being a cult leader, and is just saying it like it is. How wise it was for Jade to distinguish between the dangerous falsehoods about Jehovah's people and the person unwittingly promoting them. What? Dangerous falsehoods are we talking about, Stephen Lett? We haven't actually heard a single one. That's the whole point. The whole point to begin with was that Jade refused to listen to anything negative about the organization. No examples were given. There was not a single statement that we're able, at the end of this dramatization, to reach a conclusion on as to whether it's true or false. All we've had established in this dramatization is that Jehovah's Witnesses shouldn't listen to anything negative regardless of who's sharing it, regardless of who's unwittingly a tool of Satan in sharing information about Jehovah's Witnesses that doesn't portray them in a flattering light. Apparently, it has nothing to do with whether it's actually true or not. If it's negative, if it portrays Stephen Lett's organization in a negative light, it is automatically untrue and therefore dangerous. And he then goes on to use the word dangerous a second time. This not only protected Jade from dangerous thinking, but also helped her mother. Oh yes, dangerous thinking. You wouldn't want to have thoughts that are dangerous, would you? <laughs> Has Stephen Lett been reading George Orwell? Is he, is he just trying to make the organization conform as much as possible to the dystopian nightmare that George Orwell conjured up in 1984? with groupthink and all of that sort of thing, thought crime, it's right there, isn't it? If it's negative about the organization, if it's not flattering, if it makes you scrutinize your beliefs or subject them to reason and logic, it's not just undesirable. It's not just the voice of strangers. It's not just that you should shut it out and expect others who aren't supposed to follow the rules to also shut it out. You're endangered by this. You're endangered by even thinking about it. Your thoughts are a danger to you. So you must purge your thoughts of anything dangerous, of any dangerous thinking, thought crime. How can you really control what's going on in your brain? As I've said many, many times on this channel, your synapses, your brain chemistry is just going to do its thing. I'm sorry. We're fooling ourselves <laughs> if we can suggest that we have mastery over everything that goes on in your noggin. It's just not how it works. We do have mastery over whether we act on everything that's going on in our brain. But it's completely unrealistic and I would suggest unhealthy to promote this idea 
that certain thoughts are forbidden, that it's dangerous to have certain thoughts, especially if they are thoughts that in any way are inconvenient to a particular set of cult leaders.